Hello and good morning. My name is Mike Cornell and I'm alongside coach Ron Lathy and it, we have hit the middle of March. The weather is warming up and we're excited to share God's word with each one of you here this morning. And as we get started, we have three things we would like for you to consider or to think about and they are this. First of all, how do we show reverence for God today as it pertains to worship? And by the way, this is a really good spot if you're someone that likes to take notes. Just hit pause for a second, grab a pen, a piece of paper, grab your quarterly, your Bible, and follow right along with us here this morning. Second of all, what role does faith play in our spiritual victories? And then finally, why should we seek God's agenda for our lives? And today, we continue our quarterly study titled, Prophets Faithful to God's Covenant. And coach, here we go. Last week, the prophet Moses was front and center. This week, we welcome Joshua to the stage. And the title of this week's study is The Prophet of Conquest. And we're going to be in Joshua chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. And we're going to work through chapter 6, verse 5. And then we'll also include verses 15, 16, and 20. And Coach, could you get us started with some prayer and just kind of set the stage for today's narrative? Sure. Let us pray. Most kind and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we just come humbly thanking you for this time we have to share your word together. Lord, we thank you for each one that's decided to, to tune in and listen to our lesson today. And we just pray that, that everything we do and say here will be pleasing to you and, and what you want us to, to uh, tell in our lesson. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity you've given us each week and, and uh, for the pe many people that have, have reached out to us. And, and we're just thankful, Lord, that we are, we are able to get our message out even during this time when things are a little harder for churches to get together. Lord, we just lift up to you at this time all those that are hurting, uh, whether it be from uh, this virus or another illness of some type, Lord, or simply just uh, uh, can't get to church this morning. Uh, we just pray, Lord, again, that you would be with them and, and comfort them as only you can. We ask, Lord, now that as, as we open your word, that you would open our hearts, that we might uh, uh, receive your Holy Spirit and the wisdom and your guidance from, from the Holy Spirit. And Lord, just uh, ask you to uh, bless each one that's tuning in today. This we ask your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, yeah, as Mike said, we're going to continue into looking at our, our great, I guess these are kind of the heroes that we, we, we read about and hear about, uh, the prophets of, of old. And, and uh, today we're looking at Joshua. And you know, Mike, a lot of times when people hear about Joshua, uh, really, the the title prophet normally doesn't come to mind, right? Uh, because what we know of of, of uh, Joshua being the kind of the leader of the Israelites after Moses, at the time of our lesson, Moses has died, and uh, they are get the Israelites are getting ready to go into the land of promise, but they it's nobody's just going to kind of open the door for them. They're going to have to fight their way through. That's why Joshua is called the prophet of conquest. He's their leader right now. And we know that uh, Joshua is a prophet because just like Moses, God talks directly to Joshua and tells him what to relay to the people, which is what the prophets uh, of the Old Testament did. And uh, we know that Joshua in, in many ways uh, uh, was a hero to the people. He was a great leader. He was a uh, one who uh, the people would follow. And uh, we're going to see as we look into today's lesson how uh, they took what God's uh, plan was and proceeded to, to conquer the promised land which God had given them. So one of the things that we need, need to remember is even though God may have something great promised to us, sometimes we have to fight for it a little bit. Yeah. It's not necessarily going to be easy. And he wants us to. And that's right, right. So... Uh, Joshua also is really a prophetic or forerunner even of Christ himself. And uh, if people don't realize that the names Joshua and Jesus both basically mean the same thing. Uh, they, mean, uh, they mean the Lord is salvation. So uh, Joshua uh, is one that uh, 
uh, as we said, as we know as a great leader, but he was also a great prophet. And as Joshua led Israel into the promised land, uh, see, Jesus is going to lead us to the promised land of heaven one of these days. So uh, I have a lot in common there. Now, so what we find out here, and for those of you that are going to be looking in here, we're going to put a map up here in a minute to kind of illustrate maybe what the strategy was uh, that God gave Joshua. And what you see uh, on the map there is you see in front of you, the kind of in the middle of it is the Jordan River Valley. Uh, that comes that upper blue body that you see is the Mediterranean. The far up to the, to the top is the Mediterranean Sea. Right below that is the Sea of Galilee or Sea of Tiberias. And it comes all the way down to the Dead Sea here at the bottom. But the thing that's important is if you notice the mountains, of course, everyone knows how important in, mil in the military uh, world of the high ground. They talk about taking the high ground. Well, that's what Joshua wanted to do, and that's what God <clears throat> led him to do. And the high ground that we were, he needed to take was across the Jordan River and up toward the Mediterranean Sea. And what they did when they uh, came across the Jordan River, they basically took the nation of Israel and split it into a north and south. They actually cut the, the country in two. And that was, part, again, part of God's plan for conquering the land of Canaan. And uh, uh, we know that, that uh, the first thing they ran into was a, a strong fortified city named Jericho. And it was kind of the the guard uh, post of that that particular area. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And of course, that's probably what people remember about Joshua was uh, how he took the city of Jericho. And that's what we're going to talk about in our lesson today. So over overall, this map just kind of gives you an idea of, of how the, the nation is laid out topographically. Well, it's important also to realize that this, this group of Israelites that's, that's preparing here uh, to take over Jericho is not the generation that came out of Egypt. No, It's a totally different generation generation because they weren't allowed to, to enter into the promised right. land. So the Israelites were right on the verge of going into the promised land. They, they were preparing for battle, like Coach mentioned. But they were preparing for a military conquest, Coach. And, Little did they know that this would be a huge spiritual battle right. and a great victory for God when it right. happens. Uh, interesting, too, that later, many years later, the British Field Marshal Edmund Allaby in World War I would use the exact same strategy that God gave Joshua. So he must have been reading his Bible. It's a good plan. That's right. It's working once, maybe we'll make it work again. That's right. All right, let's get started here. And here we see Joshua's caution, and we're going to start with Joshua chapter 5, beginning with verse 13, and God's word says this, Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in front of him, or in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemy? So, a battle, uh, as the battle of Jericho approached, Coach, Joshua went out for another look, really to, to look the situation over, the towering wall that was before them, thoughts of how to conquer the city probably was going through his mind, and then he had an encounter with a stranger. Yes, and it seemed to kind of surprise him, this guy standing out there, because he had his sword drawn as if he was ready to, to do battle. And I think with the way Joshua looked at it, he wasn't real sure who he was going to do battle for. Yeah. And so he basically went up and said, are you for us or against us? <laughs> you know, and uh, so Joshua, and I think Joshua was ready to, to handle whichever answer he gave because uh, Joshua was ready to, uh, first of all, uh, he was hoping, I'm sure, the guy was for him, but it shows Joshua's bravery to not back down for from that first encounter that he had, he didn't know who this man was at the time. So uh, we, we we see here that uh, Joshua asked him, you know, are you going are you going to go for us or against us? And he and he was ready to ha take either answer, whatever he gave him. What I thought was really neat about this coach is is Joshua 
saw this person at, at the edge of the camp mm -hmm. and he could have sent any delegation of men down to meet this person but he chose to go himself yes he didn't know if it was a, a, an enemy he didn't know if it was one of his but one thing he did know he was in charge yeah and that better not be one of his men down there with a drawn sword because he hadn't given that order yet right exactly exactly so I guess to, to put it in modern day terms, he probably was saying, what's the big idea here? Mm -hmm. You know, you've got your sword out. We're not fighting yet, and I haven't given the order for my men. And then Joshua was still patiently waiting to hear from God. Right. Too. So, uh... so here we see the reply, and this is the messenger's command. And verse 14 says, Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? So the response of neither might seem confusing at first mm -hmm. here. Right. Right, yeah, when he said neither, that, I'm sure that took Joshua back for a minute. What do you mean neither? <laughs> and as we look at this, we would think, well, you, you, would, you would think that this guy was on Israel's side, and he would have said that. But I think what it is, here as we, as we start to discover who this man is, we find out that the war, neither here was not that he certainly wasn't for the Canaanites, but he wasn't sure yet whether he was for the Israelites because <laughs> they were going to have to re, re, uh, respond in a way that they had to show great faith. Right. And they had not shown that yet. So I think he's trying to tell Joshua, well, it kind of depends on your reaction and your army's reaction to what we're going to be told. So. This, this reminds me of a story about Abraham Lincoln. And, and maybe you've heard this, Coach. You probably have. Right. But someone reportedly asked Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War if God was on his side. Lincoln replied, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. Right, yeah. So, however, the, the proper question for Joshua was to consider was not whether the Lord sided with Israel, but was Joshua on the Lord's side? And that's what this individual was trying to figure out. Was right. he willing to follow God's plan mm -hmm. for the upcoming battle? All right. And that takes us to verse 15. And it says, The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So the commander of the Lord's army did not immediately reveal the nature of his visit here. No, but Joshua got the, got the message, though, the way he replied, uh, you know, when he sa said that... Uh, uh, it says, that Josh, then Joshua fell down, face down on the ground in reverence. So Joshua knew this was a special heavenly being of some kind. And as, as we've talked about before, as happened several times in the, in the Old Testament especially, right. this is a what we feel is a, a pre-incarnate Jesus Christ yep. who, who is actually talking to Joshua here. And we have several reasons as we go through our lesson we'll point out it kind of uh, solidifies that that assumption that he actually is talking to, and that's sometimes called a theophany is a, is the word they use for that when uh, like Christ or God would come down and uh, as a human, uh, and so uh, we find out here that that uh, when he when he calls him the commander of the Lord's army, nowhere else does 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 anyone. Uh, is anyone but Christ called the ca well I think the King James Version says captain and nowhere else do we find an angel being called a captain or a commander of the Lord's army and we also f find out that uh, Joshua, Joshua replies here you know that uh, he says what message does my Lord have right. so Joshua looks at him as and even when Joshua goes down to, and, and falls down to worship him uh, others had done. We find out have done that in the Bible. And if it's an angel, the angel will not allow them to do that. Right. They will tell them to get up. You know, worship only God. So when when again, these are just reasons that we believe this truly was Christ. 
Well, and it also, if it were an angel, it wouldn't make it holy ground. Right, right. And that that really takes us right into that first thought we had too, Coach. You know, here we have Joshua showing reverence mm-hmm. uh, in, in front of this being, this person. How do we show reverence for God today as as it pertains to worship? Well, the first thing that's uh, you know interesting there that you mentioned uh, was that uh, when the, when the uh, when Christ told him to take off your shoes because this is holy ground. The reason it's holy ground is because God's there. Right. Uh, and we need to understand that wherever we worship in your church, or uh, you know, uh, uh, and then we need to realize that. The same thing is true. This is God's holy ground, and although we're not told, we're, you know, told to take our shoes off, we still need to approach it as holy ground, and that shows the reverence for God's house itself. But you know, unfortunately, there's a, there's a lot of churches today where it may not be holy ground because uh, some some churches are having a hard time, I think, getting God in there. <laughs> uh, but uh, that, but I think the first very first thing we have to do to show reverence is we have to prepare our hearts to worship God. Before you ever come to church, uh, uh, you know, for whatever reason uh, or time that you're coming, uh, you have to get your heart ready to talk to God and hear God and meet God on holy ground. Uh, And we know that uh, uh, we need to leave the world outside and come into God's house. Um, we remember that we're on holy ground because God is there. We need to respond to the Holy Spirit when we feel the, the Holy Spirit moving us one way or another or to do something. And, uh, you know, there's, I've, I've said this before, there's a big difference between going to church and having church. Yeah. There's a big difference, you know. If you're truly ready to show the reverence to God that, that we should, it's a it's a really a great place to be, and you have a great time, and it's a uh, you know you've been in the presence of God, but you have to prepare yourself. We we show reverence for God by learning how to truly worship Him, and that's a lot of what you're alluding to, Coach. Jesus said that the Father is seeking people who will learn to worship Him in spirit and in truth mm-hmm. and reverent worship is not about our favorite song no it's not confined to an emotional experience or nice tingly feelings reverent worship is a lifestyle mm-hmm. and we worship in spirit when our hearts are abandoned before the lord we worship in truth when our minds are engaged and filled with the biblical understanding of god's nature and who god is to reverently worship him the way he deserves to be worshipped, we must align our hearts in, in, with his and seek to obey him. And that, that's another piece of, of what you were talking about. Modern Christianity has adopted this Jesus is my buddy attitude. And that grossly downplays who God really is. Right. It really does. Reverence does not refer to God as the big guy up in the sky or the man upstairs. Um, once we truly know who God is, we will have reverence in our hearts, the appropriate reverence needed for worship. And if we have that reverence, it won't be left when we, li- when we leave the sanctuary. That's right. We'll take it out to the, to the people. It's a lifestyle. Right. And that takes us to our first practical point, and it says, regardless of how God chooses to reveal himself, he is always worthy of our worship. And I think we've hammered that already pretty well. <laughs> yeah, we need to understand sometimes it's not going to make sense to us what God's telling us to do. Right. And uh, so we, you know, we just need to be sure that uh, however God reveals himself to us, uh, you know, that we are willing to follow what he tells us to do. And we're listening and receptive to that. Well, and everybody, God reveals himself to people differently. Right dependent on who they are and how they need, you know, his presence. Right. So just bear that in mind as you go through the lesson here. And let's go on to Joshua chapter 6 now, looking at verse 1. And here we see Jericho's status. This is interesting. Listen to this, how it sets up. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. So... 
the citizens of Jericho coach are on high alert. Yes, and they think that they're, they're fine because of the walls. They had huge high walls. The gates were closed. No one was allowed in or out. So, uh, you know, I'm sure they, they were felt uh, they were secure, but what they don't realize is they're putting their security into man-made walls right. and not, not God. And that's a lesson for all of us to understand that, that I don't care how good your security is, uh, you know, you feel your security is, you're not secure unless you have God. Well, you look, you, you talk about those walls. There's really two walls there. Mm-hmm. And, and listen to the, to the extreme that, that the inhabitants of Jericho went to prepare for this type of a day. Jericho is known as the oldest city in the world, and in Joshua's day, it was surrounded by a system of two massive stone walls. And this is relevant, because here in a while, those walls are going to disappear. Mm -hmm. The outer wall was six feet thick and about 20 feet high. Now think about that for a minute. The inner wall was 12 feet thick and 30 feet high. Between the walls was a guarded walkway about 15 feet wide. Israel's problem was that they had a city to conquer, but there was extremely huge walls in the way. So, in spite of all that, you know, they did place their security in these walls, Mm -hmm. but they were still on high alert. Mm -hmm. And they were a bit rattled, you might say. And the question is, wonder why they were rattled. Uh, One of the reasons why they could have been rattled, Coach, was there had been some spies that had infiltrated their city Mm And it may have possibly got out that there were some spies among them at one time. Yeah, and I'm sure, you know, the you can't keep things like parting of the Red Sea <laughs> quiet. It's going, they're going to make their way up to, uh, you know, they had certainly heard at least legends of the Hebrew God and what he had done for his people. And they had to be a little bit on edge probably just from things like that that they'd heard. Well, word travels fast, and, and, you know, they're probably, you know, a couple miles from Jericho, but they know that the Israelites are prepared for battle, and they know that God is on their side, and in the midst of the Israelites, God is preparing the Israelites for battle. Right. But it's more of a spiritual preparation. So the inhabitants of Jericho really have a false sense of security here. And that takes us to verse 2. And it says, Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. So the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king, and its strong warriors. Yeah, if you're Joshua, you've got to be looking at those walls you just described and think, how in the world are we going to get into that city you right. know it's all shut up and and i'm sure that was foremost on his mind were those were those walls and 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 now suddenly god or the lord says to joshua it's it's already happened <laughs> you know i've delivered jericho into your hands along with all its king and army and everything so you know god is talking to him in the past tense it's, it's already happened, you know. So uh, uh, Joshua, I'm sure, is relieved to hear God say that. Now all he has to do is wait and see how God wants him to do it. I'm sure he's thinking that we're going to have to b- build these big ladders to climb the walls yeah. and, you know, get some kind of battering <laughs> ram or whatever to get through the gates. And, and uh, Joshua, in his own mind, I'm sure, is going through all this. Needless to say, however, that uh, he probably lost a lot of sleep uh, worrying about what exactly he was going to have to do, but he'll find out that it was it's going to be no big deal. Well, he's telling Joshua the battle is over. Right. I have already won the battle. Right. And, and he's also telling him another thing. He's saying the battle was won not because of anything that you or your men mm-hmm. did. God would give the victory if Israel would claim it by faith. That's, right. that's the big key. Right. Their obedience would prove and validate the Israelites' faith. And we're going right. to talk more about that right. exactly. here in just a little bit. But if you think about this too, Coach, you think about the, the church 
in general, the Church of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. it's really the same situation. The battle is already over. Right. The story has already been written. Right. God just wants us to do battle while we're here. Mm -hmm. Exactly. The way he wants us to. Right. Right. <clears throat> and that takes us into that second question or thought, Coach. What role does faith play in our spiritual victories? Some people forget about that. That's right. But if you stop and think about it, though, in, in reality, you know, faith is the key element uh, for, the, for what you're fa facing because we need to realize that uh, God's plan, whatever he has for us, is always going to be successful. But we have to have the faith to carry it through and the faith to believe that. Right. You know, and uh, we're going to find out that he's going to give these Israelites some pretty unusual instructions about winning this battle. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, their faith, as you, as you mentioned or alluded to earlier, and it kind of answers the question back to uh, uh, Jesus when he asked, when he said that, I'm on neither side. It, they're going to have to show that they are on God's side, and that's done through their faith. Yeah, faith. A lot of times, coach, there, there's a spiritual victory that's already been won, mm -hmm. and if you don't have the faith, you're not even able to recognize it. Right. Right. But faith gives you the insight to know that there even was a spiritual victory. Uh, faith gives you the insight to know the source mm -hmm. of that spiritual victory. Right. Just like you know, God is trying to uh, appeal to Joshua here. Faith gives you the insight to trust God for the future and for that spiritual victory. And then faith gives you peace in your mm -hmm. spiritual battles. Right. Think about the peace that once this um, has been told to Joshua that the battle's over. Right. And, and for the Christian... Uh, if you're a Christian, you're going to understand what I'm about to say in that when we look at our faith and, and, and we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, then it should give us great peace because the battle's been won. And we know that whatever happens, uh, Christ has done everything that needed to be done for us to, to spend the rest of eternity in heaven. All we have to do is, is have that faith. Yep. And that's, that's where it all comes from. So it's not any different for a Christian than it was for Joshua and the Israelites. The battle's over. For, if you're a Christian and you've accepted Christ, the battle's over. It's been won. You're on the winning side. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to, you know, be, being a coach and you, know, you being a for, uh, an athlete, you know, you, it's, it, it wouldn't it be nice to walk into the game and know it's already won. <laughs> You know, before you ever ever play, it wouldn't be know. fair. You no, know, it wouldn't be fair. But it's, but you know, that's what's happened. You know, it, it's uh, that's what it means. That's what's going on here. Well, coming from two people that I know can't stand to lose and would do anything <laughs> as long as it was moral and ethical to not lose. Yeah, <laughs> that would have been comforting. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Oh, uh, and that brings us to our next practical point. God is the source of our spiritual victories. Now there's a shock. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've kind of heard that somewhere before. But we need to understand why God is the source. <clears throat> Ephesians 6.12 is something that people need to realize because especially today this is very evident. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. See, our battle is not a physical battle, and you've mentioned the word spiritual battle several times already. And that's what Ephesians uh, six twelve is telling us. We're not facing just, you know, just facing people or obstacles like walls or whatever. A lot of our problems and a lot of our battles are with actually spiritual forces yep. uh, the, of, the, of Satan and, and his demons. And we cannot do that on our own. Right. That's why we have to have Christ. As, as uh, God was wanting the Israelites to let him fight their battles, as Christians, we rely on Christ to fight those battles for us. Yeah. And uh, so that's why God is the source of our victories. Yep. Good, good, good points. 
All right, let's go on to verse 3, and it says Jericho's status still. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. And we're also going to do verse 4. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing their trumpets. The Lord's battle plan for taking Jericho was unique, yes. to say the least. I doubt this was anywhere at West Point no, in any battle no, plans. No. And I'm sure Joshua was a little bit taken aback as to what what's going on here because, uh, you know, I, I, being a military man as he was, I'm, like I said, he was probably trying to make all these plans of what he could do and the army could do and how to how to do it. And and suddenly, God says, "Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it." God is wanting to him to know that he is going to do the fighting for them. If they will just have faith in him, right, and that's that's quite a, uh, as you said, that had to take a big load off his shoulders once he if, once he realized that, hey, God's going to take care of it for us. So now look at Joshua. Okay, Joshua's got peace about it, mm -hmm. but get in the mind here for a second. Say you were a soldier under Joshua's command. Mm -hmm. Okay, you arrive at Jericho and 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 you see those walls that we talked about the dual walls that they had that were so thick and so big. You hear the city must be defeated in order to get the promised land. What are you saying to yourself? And that's a rhetorical question, right. but what are you saying to those around you, to your fellow soldiers, to your friends, to your family? Joshua announces the plan given to him by the commander uh, of the Lord's army, and you can begin marching around the wall. What are the thoughts while they're marching around the wall? Right, you know, they, they, they got to be thinking, this is crazy, this is nuts. How's this going to do anything for us, you know? Plus, they're, they're taking a chance. I'm sure those guys up on the wall had bows and arrows and oh, yeah. spears and everything. So they're probably thinking, they're going to start shooting us down here. And, uh, you know, when's Joshua going to let us attack? It, it would be weird, uh, for yeah. sure. And it, you look here, too. Uh, in, in Joshua 4, the number seven is relevant. Mm -hmm. You know, any anytime you and I have talked for years uh, about the Bible and, and the number seven and what it signifies right. in, in Scripture, it, it signifies completion. Mm -hmm. And here we see the number seven mentioned, but coming together. Right, right. And the, and this is his, God, the Lord's way of telling Joshua. And by the seventh day, it's going to be done. You know, you, you know, we're, the battle's going to be won. Everything's going to be taken care of. And uh, so, again, it's, it is completion and sometimes even means perfection. But it's, it's just showing you that God is, is in total control here. Uh, no matter, you know, if Joshua and his army had... had uh, tried to figure out a way to take the city, and even if they took the city, uh, it would have been very, uh, most humans would think, oh, look what I did, or look yeah. what we did. And God is doing this just to simply show them, you just have faith in me and everything will be fine. Yeah, it, it, it's really interesting too here because the presence of the Lord is actually in this march uh -huh. around the city. Yeah, when they carried the ark, that was actually the presence of God in their midst. Uh, and the, the ark was, uh, uh, you know, of course, that's that same ark that carried the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod, and, and uh, they carried that, that with them where whenever they went into battle. So this, this is normally how they're, they're, the way they set up for battle. And they would blow the, tr the trumpets or uh, the actual, it's called, they were called shofars, and they still use those to signal the attack and, and everything. So, uh, you know, they're, they're, this is, all has a significance, a spiritual significance mm -hmm. again, okay? And, and you mentioned them, but, well, you know, what's, what's, I wonder what these guys on top of the wall are thinking. That's exactly what I was just thinking. About, about the sixth <laughs> time they marched around the city and, and nothing is happening, uh, they're probably thinking, well, what, you know, uh, I'm sure they were very curious, and, but I'm sure also that they were uh, kind of uh, 
put on edge by that because they never know when they're going to attack, you know. So uh, I just wonder what those guys were thinking on top of that wall. Kind of, kind of a mental battle yes, really yeah, going on with yeah. them here. You know, not only is the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God himself, mm -hmm. uh, you have the entire nation of Israel, as far as men goes, you know, fighting age, uh, surrounding the city. And now they're, they're blowing the horns that they would use to uh, announce a battle. Mm -hmm. Or they also use those horns to announce the year of Jubilee right. and, and to announce right. their, their special religious occasions. Right. So there's right. a lot coming together here. Uh, yeah. what's happening as they circle around. Right. And, and this, uh, you know, I don't think we've mentioned it. It, it really it was not a big f deal about marching or totally around the city because it wasn't that far. Right. Uh, most uh, scholars feel that, <clears throat> that it was probably about a half a mile. About seven acres. Yeah, uh, around the city, which they would have done in, in you know, two and a half, three hours, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, it, w it was not a big deal, but the thing was, like I said, it was more of a a religious procession than it was uh, a, an army attack, you know. So well, here's here's another interesting thought too, Coach. They didn't take the Sabbath off. They marched uh, all seven days. Right. Matter of fact, now we don't know what day the Sabbath fell on. Right. In their marching, was it the first day, the sixth day, or the seventh day? But they marched seven days. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And that takes us to our next practical point. God's methods of dealing with us are not always what we expect. Some, actually, it could be comical. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, and, and like we said, if you put your, try to put yourself in the place of, the, of these Israelites, uh, they've got to be very confused, uh, you know, even though they understand what God's doing a little bit. But, uh, but we, we need to understand that, that we don't understand God. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways uh, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So we're not supposed to understand God, we're supposed to obey God. Right. And, and it does seem like often that God is, you know, you're thinking that... Uh, uh, you know, God, uh, I don't understand this. Well, we're not supposed to. We're not supposed to. Because, you know, God, we need to remember, and I think we, we oftentimes don't give God the credit he deserves. He is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-powerful, uh, and, and sovereign over all creation. And we will never totally understand God. Because, as he said, his ways are, are so far above us. And, and uh, uh, but all, all like Joshua here, all he tells us to do is obey right. and follow him, and everything will work out for the best. Well, God deals with each one of us different, and we've talked about that in the past, because He created all of us different. Right. He knows the way He needs to deal with you is different than the, than the way He needs to deal with me, and I think that's really neat that, yes. that we have right. that kind of an intimate relationship with God that he knows how to deal with us. Exactly. He knows each, each one of us what's best for us. Yep. And that takes us to verse 5. And here we see Jericho's status still. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So. After days of hearing only shorter blasts of the horns, mm -hmm. the long blasts on the seventh day would probably feel like a grand celebration, for, at uh, least for the Israelites. Right. <laughs> and the shout they were to give was a shout of victory. Right. Again, saying it's already done. Uh, you know, the battle has not really begun yet, but it's over for, the, for you Canaanites in there in, in, uh, in Jericho. So, and all that was to come together on that seventh day when they marched around uh, seven times. So, and, and then again, those, those walls that the, that the Canaanites had put up for protection, God simply collapsed them in a moment. Yep. And, and I'm sure that's where a lot of the people were killed in Jericho because they were on those walls. And it's, it doesn't say, when, 
it does say that the walls fell flat, but the actual translation means they collapsed. So I can see all those people. First of all, they're, they're probably up there watching the Israelites march around and say, well, here they go again, you know, and probably starting to even make fun of them. But when they were there, suddenly the walls collapsed when they gave that great shout. Yeah, they had to wonder, too, uh, on the seventh day, you know, every day prior to that, they just ran around once. Right. And then they probably, their guards began to get into a routine and let down. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it got louder right. and they mar marched around six more times. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the walls were an obstacle for the Israelites. You know, when prior to meeting the pre-incarnate Christ, that was probably Joshua's obstacle. He's probably mm -hmm. trying to figure out in a military sense, right. how are we going to conquer those walls? Right. That had to be <clears throat> foremost in his mind, in his plan. And the same with his army. Sure. So, but as we go through life, we have obstacles that we face mm -hmm. as well. And perhaps it, it's a, lo a lost loved one. Uh, perhaps it's a lost community over which we are burdened. Uh, a ministry from the Lord that we feel inadequate about. Family trouble. That, that tears, you know, that tears at our hearts and leaves us wondering what to do. It could be financial trouble that stresses us to the limits. Medical problem. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're qualified to say that. I, I can tell you that, absolutely. <clears throat> but it could be any, any number of a million different things. Right. But the Israelites are going to give us a good template here on how to let God fight right. the battle. Right, exactly. And that takes us into that, that third and that final question or thought, and that is, why should we seek God's agenda for our lives? <clears throat> well, the thing is, we have to understand some things about God, God that we're not willing to admit sometimes. Uh, we like to do things <clears throat> ourselves and take care of things ourselves. And sometimes we feel like, well, if I turn it over to God, I'm losing control. Well, you know, I got a couple questions. You know, if if you're going to lose control of your life, who would you rather have control of it than God? Yeah. Uh, because you know, God's agenda is is His will for our lives, and uh, it's the it's the best way to live. He's trying to show us this is the best way to live. This is how you can best serve me, and. Uh, and as I said, you know, as we're talking about sides here, who whose side would you rather be on? You know, and uh, and that's kind of what you're, you know, you break it down into today's terminology. Are you going to be on God's side? Are you going to be on Satan's side? <laughs> There's no in the middle. There's no you can't ride the fence. It's, it's one or the other. And if you're not for God, you're against God, as the Bible tells us. So. We need to understand again that being on God's side ensures victory. Right. Uh, and 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 we've already talked about some of the benefits, the peace we get knowing the victory's already been won. Just like Joshua felt, I'm sure, when when God told him, "I've already given you the Jericho." You know, well, God has already taken care of all the fear of death and uh, of the future if we just put our faith in Him. Here, here's what people forget too, Coach, you, in answering this question. Why should we seek God's agenda for our lives? And, and, and this is what a lot of Christians today forget. And, and this is something we all need to, to think about and remember. First of all, we need to remember, it's not about us. It's about right. Him. Right. And that's what a lot of people forget today. Mm -hmm. Yes. And second of all, he cares about us more than we care about ourselves. And it doesn't matter how much you like yourself or you care about yourself. And I'm talking in a healthy way. Yeah. God cares more for you than that. And his will for our lives is, is best. And that's what you said. But why would we think we know better than that? Right. Right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's just one of those things that, that we need to realize. We need to let God, you know, follow God as, as Joshua did here. And let him take care of all the all the things. Yep. Okay. That takes us to our next practical point, and it says remarkable results are in store for those who place their trust in God. And we're going to see some remarkable results here in a right. minute. Right. <laughs> and 
And I can tell you from personal, recent personal experience, God is still a God of miracles. Yes, you and, can. <laughs> and uh, remarkable results, uh, right? You know, uh, and, and it's uh, uh, one of those things uh, until you actually go through it personally, you don't really understand how true that is. Uh, so uh, uh, re the remarkable results, again, are because God, we let God take care of it, not because of what we do. And that's the whole thing here about our lesson. It's all of these are to show that God, show other people that God still is in control. And, uh, you know, give him the glory. It's not for us. It's not what we do. It's not how we do things. But it's how God is sovereign in our lives. Well put. And that takes us to verse 15. And now we're going to surround the city. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. So the army obeyed everything that Joshua told them from the Lord with no deviations. Right, right. <clears throat> and uh, we find out that they did exactly what God had told, followed his plan right down to the letter. And... Uh, the results speak for themselves, as we've already talked about. The results, the the walls, as the song goes, came tumbling down, and and uh, they did actually nothing, as far as the army goes, did nothing to attack or, you know, to destroy anything. So <clears throat> we see here that following God's advice and His plan, He did all the work for them. So wouldn't that have been neat to? To be there and to, you know, showing those rock cliffs that you showed in the map back mm -hmm. in the beginning. Maybe be setting up there and, and setting up there with binoculars, mm -hmm. just kind of watching all this unfold and being able to hear all of it. Right. It would have been really, really loud. Right. And, <laughs> and then there's some other things that, that uh, we need to understand that we kind of, they, our lesson doesn't really get into to some things that I think are kind of important to bring out here in that the Canaanites were very wicked people. Right. And uh, when God, <clears throat> when, they, when they destroyed the city, basically God told them to, uh, that he was taking over the city and claiming it for himself. And what that meant was that all of this, the terrible things that had gone on, I mean, they, they even were uh, uh, sacrificing children to their gods, uh, you know. And uh, so God didn't want the Israelites getting caught up in any of these pagan rituals and things. So basically, this is one of the places where God said, we're going to wipe them all out. And we don't want anybody left. We don't want any of their animals left. We don't want any anything that is uh, uh, they have to do with. I want you to destroy it all. And other, other than uh, he told them that they could take some of the gold and silver for his own treasury. Right. But not to keep for themselves, but to dedicate to him. And uh, uh, But these people were totally destroyed by God. And we, you know, some of you, some people may be out there thinking, "Well, that's terrible. God would destroy a." Uh, well, I take that back. There was one saved, and that was Rahab, the right. prostitute. We forgot about Rahab. Yeah, Rahab was there because <laughs> she helped save the spot, the spies that came in. But, 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 you know, I, I don't care what you, whether you think God's mean or or bad because He's doing that, folks. That's what we're all facing. He's telling all of us here on Earth right now. You know, you can either be saved or you can be destroyed. And he, and he is not, has no qualms about destroying those that are pagan and those that have turned against him and will not accept his sacrifice. So that's something we're all going to face whether we agree with it or not. Well, the Israelites are actually an instrument here of God's judgment. Mm -hmm. Right. That's what's happening. Right. And, and he's punishing the, these people by demanding that everyone be killed, the men, the women, the children, every yeah, living yeah. animal, destroy everything that's there. Right. And, and yeah, keep some of the, the, the valuables for the Lord's treasury. Right. But if you catch somebody taking some, mm -hmm. what happened to them? That's right. They, they, uh, 
suffered from God's wrath <laughs> That's <they>? right. <laughs> in the worst way. So, yeah, it was not an individual thing. It was, again, everything is back to the reverence of God. Yeah. And uh, that's what this, is, this whole lesson is being about. All right, let's go on to verse 16. And it says, The seventh time around when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now, with the word shout, Joshua was making a statement of faith. That's yes, basically what's going on. Absolutely, because he, he believed, and, and like I said, it was a victory shout. And, and that shout was basically saying, the battle's over, and we haven't, we haven't shot an arrow or uh, uh, put a ladder up or anything. The battle's over. So uh, it, it's just amazing when you stop and think that God did all that, and they, the, they didn't have to do anything other than follow his lead. Can you imagine how loud that would have been? Mm. That would have been absolutely amazing. And that takes us to our next practical point. God does not have to use our means and methods to accomplish His purposes. No, God doesn't, contrary to what sometimes we believe, God doesn't need our help, okay? Nor does He want our help, for that matter. <laughs> uh, you know, or does He need our advice about things? We seem to, we seem to put, that's where we put ourselves ahead of God sometimes. And, and why we don't sit back and just let God do what he's, what he's telling us that he will do for us. So he doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything we have. He, he is in control of everything. And, and that's what we have to, we have to give up our control to be able to give into his control. Yeah, we have to give up what control we think we have. Right. <laughs> right. But God can and will use whatever means necessary to right. accomplish his will and purpose. And that takes us to verse 20, our last verse here this morning. And here we see seizing the city. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in, and they took the city. So. In accord with Joshua's command, the trumpets sounded and the army shouted. Right. And, and you know, it's amazing that there are people today that try to say, oh, there must have been an earthquake or, or maybe it was the sound waves from that great shout that caused those. You know, you know, man's always trying to explain the supernatural of God, and they can't do it. And, and this, this was truly supernatural. It was all God. It was nothing else. And uh, uh, so we as humans just fail to sometimes to think that's possible anymore, especially today, you know, and, and we don't realize that we don't understand exactly how powerful God is. and We don't give him credit for that. But that's all it took to bring down those great walls that you described earlier. And uh, like I said, the Probably hundreds or thousands of people were killed when those walls fell. Just when the walls collapsed. Right. You know. And then all the Israel, Israeli army had to do was go in and mop up a little bit. And yep. it was over. Well, if you look at this too, Coach, Jericho really represents the world to the believer. When you mm -hmm. think about it. it, it the world is strong. The, the world is formidable. The world is foreboding. The conquest, though, really, if we're going to conquer the world standards as we need to, mm -hmm. we have to have faith. It really depends on our faith. Right. And Israel was victorious over Jericho because of three things. Their faith, their obedience, and the work of God. Right. Those are the only reasons. Right. And that takes us to our last practical point here this morning. God's work done God's way will always be victorious. Yeah, the key word is, is done God's way. That's the part we have trouble with. But, uh, yeah, I mean, how many times have we kind of shown this already in our lesson? You know, God, whatever, and the nation of Israel kept forgetting that throughout their history. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and they still have forgotten it today. Um, but uh, the idea is that God simply had told him, you're my people. I'll take care of you if you just follow and obey me. And you don't have to worry about it. And 
we see through back through the Bibles, the Old Testament especially, how many times God did exactly that, just like he did here in Jericho. So uh, he, he wants us simply to obey him and, and literally be on his side. Uh, you know, that's, that's the thing that, uh, and that's, uh, I thought that's a great quote from Abraham Lincoln, you know. Uh, and it's a, be kind of a, a nice thing to live your life by. Sure. I don't, I don't care whether God's on my side or not, just as long as I'm on his side. That's right. That's all that matters. You know, in light of this whole, this whole narrative here that we've talked about, and this is real. This really happened. It's historical. It's biblical. Ar archaeologists have dug up these walls. That's right. You know, I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's what they're finding in Israel, uh, that the longer we go and the more they dig up things, the more they prove the Bible, what the Bible said is true. Well, and the archaeologists have found out how wicked these people were right. in their findings, right. which, which validates everything we're talking about. But just like in the day of, of this great battle in Jericho, we too can have a great victory. And you have to remember that. We can prevail in whatever situation we are facing right now. And each one of you out there are facing a situation you either have faced a situation, you're going to face a situation, or you just came out of facing a situation. We must learn the lesson from Israel. God has promised us victory. It might not be a great miracle like we witnessed with Coach. Apparently, God still has some things he wants you to accomplish. Hopefully. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but God has promised us the victory. Just remember that, whatever you're dealing with. And that takes us to our final thought to remember, and that is this, Coach. Victory follows obedience to the Lord. And could you take that thought to remember and give us some, some final thoughts and remarks here? Sure, again, that kind of sums up our whole lesson. Uh, you know, the, the victory comes from obedience. It doesn't come from our strength. It doesn't come from what we do. It's simply when we are obedient to the, to the Lord, uh, we're going to we're going to have victory in, in whatever it is, and uh, so the other thing that I, I'd like to kind of close with is this: you know, I'm sure when Joshua and his soldiers heard God's plan for taking the city, they're thinking, "This can never work. That can't be all there is to it." You know, and, and they uh, and they probably at first you know had a hard time just following the advice without questioning. You know, you'd have, they had to question in their mind. But as they followed and started becoming more confident that God was going to do what he said he was going to do, then they, they kind of fell in line and, and of course they got the victory. Well, what that kind of, how that pertains to us is that when we hear the plan of salvation and you tell someone to be saved, all you have to do is accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and repent of your sins and, and uh, ask Him to come into your heart and take over your life. You know, there's a lot, of, a lot of people out there that say that can't be all there is to it. That can't be all there is. I've got to do something. And people think they have to do works and they have to do th something to earn their way into heaven. Folks, uh, that, that's the wrong thing to be thinking because Everything that needed to be done for you to go to heaven has been done. Mm -hmm. Just like when, with, the, with the Israelites here. Everything that needed to be done to take Jericho, God did. And he, he has already given us his son to pay the price of, of what we should have to pay. And all we have to do is accept his sacrifice. And as, if we do that, then that is all there is to it. And we just have to realize that God offers that to us because of his great love for us. And we are his people, just like the Israelites were his people. So if you haven't given your heart to Christ yet, no, there's no time like the present to do that. Because you never know when something's going to jump up and, and bite you, uh, either physically or uh, spiritually. And like I said, you, you're always fighting those spiritual forces that we talked about. So all you have to do is accept Christ, and this will start you on the, uh, the greatest life you can live uh, with a guarantee of what will follow. Well, folks, the gospel message is really that simple, the way you just heard Coach describe it. 
And matter of fact, it's so simple that the smallest of children can understand it. That's what I really like mm-hmm. about the gospel message. One of the things I really like right. about it, it's not complicated at all. No. But if you have any questions about the gospel message or, or how to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we would love to talk to you about that. And actually, we'd love to talk to you about anything. If you have questions about anything that we've talked about here this morning, uh, feel free to reach out to us here at the church. This is Pine Grove Baptist Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. You should see the contact information above my head on the screen. And we'd just love to have a conversation with you uh, about anything we've talked We love to talk about the Bible, in case you haven't figured that we out. We just kind of love to talk. I think <laughs> yeah. what it is, Mike. <laughs> but for those of you who watch from week to week, uh, or maybe this is your very first time, uh, we would encourage you to share this on with your friends on Facebook or on YouTube or on Parlor or Twitter or whatever social media outlet you use, or or maybe you just have a special friend that doesn't know Jesus that you would like to download this onto a flash drive and just hand it to them and say, hey, watch these two guys. But we thank each one of you for making us part of your day. We, we consider this a high privilege, and we certainly don't take it for granted. Next week, we have a new prophet front and center, the very little-known prophet named Halda and it's called the prophet of wisdom so until next time this is mike cornell along with coach ron lathy and our production manager john ayers wishing everybody have a blessed week and we hope to see you real soon